Chapter 7 For some reason or other the house was crowded that night, and the fat Jew manager who met them at the door was beaming from ear to ear with an oily, tremulous smile. He escorted them to their box with a sort of pompous humility, waving his fat jewelled hands and talking at the top of his voice dorian gray loathed him more than ever he felt as if he had come to look for miranda and had been met by caliban lord henry upon the other hand rather liked him at least he declared he did and insisted on shaking him by the hand and assuring him that he was proud to meet a man who had discovered a real genius and had gone bankrupt over a poet hallward amused himself with watching the faces in the pit the heat was terribly oppressive and the huge sunlight flamed like a monstrous dahlia with petals of yellow fire the youths in the gallery had taken off their coats and waistcoats and hung them over the side they talked to each other across the theatre and shared their oranges with the tawdry girls who sat beside them some women were laughing in the pit their voices were horribly shrill and discordant the sound of the popping of corks came from the bar what a place to find one's divinity in said lord henry yes answered dorian gray it was here i found her and she is divine beyond all living things when she acts you will forget everything these common rough people with their coarse faces and brutal gestures become quite different when she is on the stage they sit silently and watch her they weep and laugh as she wills them to do she makes them as responsive as a violin she spiritualizes them and one feels that they are of the same flesh and blood as one's self the same flesh and blood as one's self oh i hope not exclaimed lord henry who was scanning the occupants of the gallery through his opera glass don't pay any attention to him dorian said the painter i understand what you mean and i believe in this girl any one you love must be marvellous and any girl who has the effect you describe must be fine and noble to spiritualize one's age that is something worth doing if this girl can give a soul to those who have lived without one if she can create the sense of beauty in people whose lives have been sordid and ugly if she can strip them of their selfishness and lend them tears for sorrows that are not their own she's worthy of all your adoration worthy of the adoration of the world this marriage is quite right i did not think so at first but i admit it now the gods made sibyl vane for you without her you would have been incomplete thanks basil answered dorian gray pressing his hand i knew that you would understand me harry is so cynical he terrifies me but here is the orchestra it is quite dreadful but it only lasts for about five minutes then the curtain rises and you will see the girl to whom i am going to give all my life to whom i have given everything that is good in me a quarter of an hour afterwards amidst an extraordinary turmoil of applause sibyl vane stepped on to the stage yes she was certainly lovely to look at one of the loveliest creatures lord henry thought that he had ever seen there was something of the fawn in her shy grace and startled eyes a faint blush like the shadow of a rose in a mirror of silver came to her cheeks as she glanced at the crowded enthusiastic house she stepped back a few paces and her lips seemed to tremble basil hallward leaped to his feet and began to applaud motionless and as one in a dream sat dorian gray gazing at her lord henry peered through his glasses murmuring charming charming the scene was the hall of capulet's house and romeo in his pilgrim's dress had entered with mercutio and his other friends 
the band such as it was struck up a few bars of music and the dance began through the crowd of ungainly shabbily dressed actors sibyl vane moved like a creature from a finer world her body swayed while she danced as a plant sways in the water the curves of her throat were the curves of a white lily her hands seemed to be made of cool ivory yet she was curiously listless she showed no sign of joy when her eyes rested on romeo the few words she had to speak good pilgrim you do wrong your hand too much which mannerly devotion shows in this for saints have hands that pilgrim's hands do touch and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss with the brief dialogue that follows was spoken in a thoroughly artificial manner the voice was exquisite but from the point of view of tone it was absolutely false it was wrong in colour it took away all the life from the verse it made the passion unreal dorian gray grew pale as he watched her he was puzzled and anxious neither of his friends dared to say anything to him she seemed to them to be absolutely incompetent they were horribly disappointed yet they felt that the true test of any juliet is the balcony scene of the second act they waited for that if she failed there there was nothing in her she looked charming as she came out in the moonlight that could not be denied but the staginess of her acting was unbearable and grew worse as she went on her gestures became absurdly artificial she overemphasized everything that she had to say the beautiful passage thou knowest the mask of night is on my face else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak to-night was declaimed with the painful precision of a schoolgirl who has been taught to recite by some second-rate professor of elocution when she leaned over the balcony and came to those wonderful lines although i joy in thee i have no joy of this contract to-night it is too rash too unadvised too sudden too like the lightning which doth cease to be ere one can say it lightens sweet good-night this bud of love by summer's ripening breath may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet she spoke the words as though they conveyed no meaning to her it was not nervousness indeed so far from being nervous she was absolutely self-contained it was simply bad art she was a complete failure even the common uneducated audience of the pit and gallery lost their interest in the play they got restless and began to talk loudly and to whistle the jew manager who was standing at the back of the dress circle stamped and swore with rage the only person unmoved was the girl herself when the second act was over there came a storm of hisses and lord henry got up from his chair and put on his coat she is quite beautiful dorian he said but she can't act let us go i am going to see the play through answered the lad in a hard bitter voice i am awfully sorry that i made you waste an evening harry i apologize to you both my dear dorian i should think miss vane was ill interrupted hallward we will come some other night i wish she were ill he rejoined but she seems to me to be simply callous and cold she is entirely altered last night she was a great artist this evening she is merely a commonplace mediocre actress don't talk like that about anyone you love dorian love is a more wonderful thing than art they are both simply forms of imitation remarked lord henry but do let us go 
Dorian, you must not stay here any longer. It is not good for one's morals to see bad acting. Besides, I don't suppose you will want your wife to act. So what does it matter if she plays Juliet like a wooden doll? She is very lovely, and if she knows as little about life as she does about acting, she will be delightful experience. There are only two kinds of people who are really fascinating. People who know absolutely everything, and people who know absolutely nothing. Good heavens, my dear boy, don't look so tragic. The secret of remaining young is never to have an emotion that is unbecoming. Come to the club with Basil and myself. We will smoke cigarettes and drink to the beauty of Sybil Vane. She is beautiful. What more can you want? Go away, Harry, cried the lad. I want to be alone. Basil, you must go. Ah, can't you see that my heart is breaking? The hot tears came to his eyes. His lips trembled, and rushing to the back of the box, he leaned up against the wall, hiding his face in his hands. Let us go, Basil, said Lord Henry, with a strange tenderness in his voice, and the two young men passed out together. A few moments afterwards, the footlights flared up, and the curtain rose on the third act. Dorian Gray went back to his seat. He looked pale and proud, and indifferent. The play dragged on, and seemed interminable. Half of the audience went out, tramping in heavy boots and laughing. The whole thing was a fiasco. The last act was played to almost empty benches. The curtain went down on a titter and some groans. As soon as it was over, Dorian Gray rushed behind the scenes into the green room. The girl was standing there alone, with a look of triumph on her face. Her eyes were lit with an exquisite fire. There was a radiance about her. Her parted lips were smiling over some secret of their own. When he entered, she looked at him, and an expression of infinite joy came over her. How badly I acted tonight, Dorian, she cried. Horribly, he answered, gazing at her in amazement. Horribly, it was dreadful. Are you ill? You have no idea what it was. You have no idea what I suffered. The girl smiled. Dorian, she answered lingering over his name with long-drawn music in her voice as though it were sweeter than honey to the red petals of her mouth dorian you should have understood but you understand now don't you understand what he asked angrily why i was so bad tonight why i shall always be bad why i shall never act well again he shrugged his shoulders you are ill i suppose when you are ill, you shouldn't act. You make yourself ridiculous. My friends were bored. I was bored. She seemed not to listen to him. She was transfigured with joy. An ecstasy of happiness dominated her. Dorian, Dorian, she cried. Before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. It was only in the theatre that I lived. I thought that it was all true. I was Rosalind one night and Portia the other. The joy of Beatrice was my joy, and the sorrows of Cordelia were mine also. I believed in everything. The common people who acted with me seemed to me to be godlike. The painted scenes were my world. I knew nothing but shadows, and I thought them real. You came, oh, my beautiful love, and you freed my soul from prison. You taught me what reality really is. Tonight... For the first time in my life, I saw through the hollowness, the sham, the silliness of the empty pageant in which I had always played. Tonight, for the first time, I became conscious that the Romeo was hideous and old and painted, that the moonlight in the orchard was false, that the scenery was vulgar, and that the words I had to speak were unreal, were not my words, were not what I wanted to say. You had brought me something higher something of which all art is but a reflection. You had made me understand what love really is. My love, my love, Prince Charming, Prince of Life, 
I have grown sick of shadows. You are more to me than all art can ever be. What have I to do with the puppets of a play? When I came on tonight, I could not understand how it was that everything had gone from me. I thought that I was going to be wonderful. I found that I could do nothing. Suddenly it dawned on my soul what it all meant. The knowledge was exquisite to me. I heard them hissing, and I smiled. What could they know of love such as ours? Take me away, Dorian. Take me away with you, where we can be quite alone. I hate the stage. I might mimic a passion that I do not feel, but I cannot mimic one that burns me like fire. Oh, Dorian, Dorian, you understand now what it signifies. Even if I could do it, it would be profanation for me to play at being in love. You have made me see that. He flung himself down on the sofa and turned away his face. You have killed my love, he muttered. She looked at him in wonder and laughed. He made no answer. She came across to him and with her little fingers stroked his hair. She knelt down and pressed his hands to her lips. He drew them away and a shudder ran through him. Then he leaped up and went to the door. Yes, he cried. You have cured my love. You used to stir my imagination. Now you don't even stir my curiosity. You simply produce no effect. I loved you because you were marvellous, because you had genius and intellect, because you realized the dreams of great poets and gave shape and substance to the shadows of art. You have thrown it all away. You are shallow and stupid. My God, how mad I was to love you! What a fool I have been! You are nothing to me now. I will never see you again. I will never think of you. I will never mention your name. You don't know what you were to me once. Why, once? Oh, I can't bear to think of it. I wish I had never laid eyes upon you. You have spoiled the romance of my life. How little you can know of love if you say it mars your art. Without your art, you were nothing. I would have made you famous, splendid, magnificent. The world would have worshipped you, and you would have borne my name. What are you now? A third-rate actress with a pretty face. The girl grew white and trembled. She clenched her hands together, and her voice seemed to catch in her throat. You are not serious, Dorian? she murmured. You are acting. Acting. I leave that to you. You do it so well. He answered bitterly. She rose from her knees, and with a piteous expression of pain in her face, came across the room to him. She put her hand upon his arm, and looked into his eyes. He thrust her back. Don't touch me, he cried. A low moan broke from her, and she flung herself at his feet, and lay there like a trampled flower. Dorian, Dorian, don't leave me she whispered i am so sorry i didn't act well i was thinking of you all the time but i will try indeed i will try it came so suddenly across me my love for you i think i should never have known it if you had not kissed me if we had not kissed each other kiss me again my love don't go away from me i couldn't bear it oh don't go away from me my brother no never mind he didn't mean it he was in jest but you, oh, can't you forgive me for tonight? I will work so hard and try to improve. Don't be cruel to me, because I love you better than anything in the world. After all, it is only once that I have not pleased you. But you are quite right, Dorian. I should have shown myself more of an artist. It was foolish of me, and yet I couldn't help it. Oh, don't leave me. Don't leave me. A fit of passionate sobbing choked her. She crouched on the floor like a wounded thing, and Dorian Gray, with his beautiful eyes, looked down at her, and his chiselled lips curled in exquisite disdain. There is always something ridiculous about the emotions of people whom one has ceased to love. Sibyl Vane seemed to him to be absurdly melodramatic. 
her tears and sobs annoyed him i am going he said at last in his calm clear voice i don't wish to be unkind but i can't see you again you have disappointed me she wept silently and made no answer but crept nearer a little hand stretched blindly out and appeared to be seeking for him he turned on his heel and left the room in a few moments he was out of the theatre where he went to he hardly knew he remembered wandering through dimly lit streets past gaunt black shadowed archways and evil-looking houses women with hoarse voices and harsh laughter had called after him drunkards had reeled by cursing and chattering to themselves like monstrous apes he had seen grotesque children huddled upon doorsteps and heard shrieks and oaths from gloomy courts as the dawn was just breaking he found himself close to covent garden the darkness lifted and flushed with faint fires the sky hollowed itself into a perfect pearl huge carts filled with nodding lilies rumbled slowly down the polished empty street the air was heavy with the perfume of the flowers and their beauty seemed to bring him an anodyne for his pain he followed into the market and watched the men unloading their wagons a white smocked carter offered him some cherries he thanked him wondered why he refused to accept any money for them and began to eat them listlessly they had been plucked at midnight and the coldness of the moon had entered into them a long line of boys carrying crates of striped tulips and of yellow and red roses defiled in front of him threading their way through the huge jade-green piles of vegetables under the portico with its grey sun-bleached pillars loitered a troop of draggled bare-headed girls waiting for the auction to be over others crowded round the swinging doors of the coffee-house in the piazza the heavy cart-horses slipped and stamped upon the rough stones shaking their bells and trappings some of the drivers were lying asleep on a pile of sacks iris-necked and pink-footed the pigeons ran about picking up seeds after a little while he hailed a hansom and drove home for a few moments he loitered upon the doorstep looking round at the silent square with its blank close-shuttered windows and its staring blinds the sky was pure opal now and the roofs of the houses glistened like silver against it from some chimney opposite a thin wreath of smoke was rising it curled a violet riband through the nacre-coloured air in the huge gilt venetian lantern spoil of some doge's barge that hung from the ceiling of the great oak-panelled hall of entrance lights were still burning from three flickering jets thin blue petals of flame they seemed rimmed with white fire he turned them out and having thrown his hat and cape on the table passed through the library towards the door of his bedroom a large octagonal chamber on the ground floor that in his new-born feeling for luxury he had just had decorated for himself and hung with some curious renaissance tapestries that had been discovered stored in a disused attic at selby royal as he was turning the handle of the door his eye fell upon the portrait basil hallward had painted of him he started back as if in surprise then he went on into his own room looking somewhat puzzled after he had taken the buttonhole out of his coat he seemed to hesitate finally he came back went over to the picture and examined it 
in the dim arrested light that struggled through the cream-coloured silk blinds the face appeared to him to be a little changed the expression looked different one would have said that there was a touch of cruelty in the mouth it was certainly strange he turned round and walking to the window drew up the blind the bright dawn flooded the room and swept the fantastic shadows into dusky corners where they lay shuddering but the strange expression that he had noticed in the face of the portrait seemed to linger there to be more intensified even the quivering ardent sunlight showed him the lines of cruelty round the mouth as clearly as if he had been looking into a mirror after he had done some dreadful thing he winced and taking up from the table an oval glass framed in ivory cupids one of lord henry's many presents to him glanced hurriedly into its polished depths no line like that warped his red lips what did it mean he rubbed his eyes and came close to the picture and examined it again there were no signs of any change when he looked into the actual painting and yet there was no doubt that the whole expression had altered it was not a mere fancy of his own the thing was horribly apparent he threw himself into a chair and began to think suddenly there flashed across his mind what he had said in basil hallward's studio the day the picture had been finished yes he remembered it perfectly he had uttered a mad wish that he himself might remain young and the portrait grow old that his own beauty might be untarnished and the face on the canvas bear the burden of his passions and his sins that the painted image might be seared with the lines of suffering and thought and that he might keep all the delicate bloom and loveliness of his then just conscious boyhood surely his wish had not been fulfilled such things were impossible it seemed monstrous even to think of them and yet there was the picture before him with the touch of cruelty in the mouth cruelty had he been cruel it was the girl's fault not his he had dreamed of her as a great artist had given his love to her because he had thought her great then she had disappointed him she had been shallow and unworthy and yet a feeling of infinite regret came over him as he thought of her lying at his feet sobbing like a little child he remembered with what callousness he had watched her why had he been made like that why had such a soul been given to him but he had suffered also during the three terrible hours that the play had lasted he had lived centuries of pain eon upon eon of torture his life was well worth hers she had marred him for a moment if he had wounded her for an age besides women were better suited to bear sorrow than men they lived on their emotions they only thought of their emotions when they took lovers it was merely to have someone with whom they could have scenes lord henry had told him that and lord henry knew what women were why should he trouble about sibyl vane she was nothing to him now but the picture what was he to say of that it held the secret of his life and told his story it had taught him to love his own beauty would it teach him to loathe his own soul would he ever look at it again no it was merely an illusion wrought on the troubled senses 
the horrible night that he had passed had left phantoms behind it suddenly there had fallen upon his brain that tiny scarlet speck that makes men mad the picture had not changed it was folly to think so yet it was watching him with its beautiful marred face and its cruel smile its bright hair gleamed in the early sunlight its blue eyes met his own a sense of infinite pity not for himself but for the painted image of himself came over him it had altered already and would alter more its gold would wither into grey its red and white roses would die for every sin that he committed a stain would fleck and wreck its fairness but he would not sin the picture changed or unchanged would be to him the visible emblem of conscience he would resist temptation he would not see lord henry any more would not at any rate listen to those subtle poisonous theories that in basil hallward's garden had first stirred within him the passion for impossible things he would go back to sybil vane make her amends marry her try to love her again yes it was his duty to do so she must have suffered more than he had poor child he had been selfish and cruel to her the fascination that she had exercised over him would return they would be happy together his life with her would be beautiful and pure he got up from his chair and drew a large screen right in front of the portrait shuddering as he glanced at it how horrible he murmured to himself and he walked across to the window and opened it when he stepped out on to the grass he drew a deep breath the fresh morning air seemed to drive away all his sombre passions he thought only of sibyl a faint echo of his love came back to him he repeated her name over and over again the birds that were singing in the dew-drenched garden seemed to be telling the flowers about her 